Good evening, brothers, sisters. Danny Hyde here. I'm the pastor of Oceanside United Reformed Church here in uh, beautiful Oceanside, San Diego, California. Uh, it's beautiful today. It's a little bit overcast for us. I'm not sure how it is for you, but uh, nice and uh, sunny in the, in, the, in the afternoon and then a little overcast at night. Uh, here we are for um, weekly Bible study, and we are going to be studying together uh, the book of Revelation. That's where we've been for a little bit, and we'll be in chapter 5 tonight. So um, we're going to hopefully get to the whole chapter. We should um, have a good little three-point sermon-style outline, so it uh, should uh, get us through in a, in a decent amount of time. So if you have a Bible... Revelation chapter number five, and I mentioned the last couple of times, if you've been with me, uh, us, that uh, I've been re-reading through the New King James. That's the Bible that I, um, that's the Bible that I had when I first became a Christian, and uh, one of our deacons, Johannes Kalenis, John Kalen, uh, recently gave me a new Bible. So um, my notes are, uh, I use ESV for notes, so my notes are the ESV, but I'll be reading the New King James, so whatever Bible you have uh, is fine. Sorry, let me get situated here. Um, so Revelation 5, and if you like taking notes, if you like jotting down notes or typing them out, I'll uh, give you the points and the verses that they go with in just a few minutes here. Um, so Revelation 5, let's begin, uh, let's actually, I'm sorry, let's uh, let's begin with uh, prayer, our... our um, our theme uh, today going to be oops, sorry. Our theme uh, this night is uh, "Behold the Lamb." That's the Lord Jesus Christ here, as He's uh, described and uh, depicted uh, in His throne on His throne in heaven. So, Revelation chapter five, "Behold the Lamb." Let's do that together as we pray and ask the Lord to uh, open His Word to us, to teach us, to guide us into all truth. So, let's pray. Our merciful and our loving Heavenly Father, we bless and praise you for another day of life, and we thank you most especially that we have already in this life eternal life, and we have the assurance that we belong to Jesus, body, soul, life, and in death, because we have come to you through him, your Son, our Lord. We've come broken by our sins, and you have picked us up, and you are putting us back together by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we pray, Lord, that our minds that were made to, to know you in truth, that have uh, fallen into uh, darkness by our sins, that you might illuminate our minds by your Spirit to, to know your truth, to think your thoughts after you. Lord, fill our hearts, our affections with joy and praise. Uh, remake us, Lord, in your image in that way as well, and Lord, that our wills, how we live our life, the choices that we make and the things that we do, would be to your honor and glory because of what we hear tonight. We ask all this in Jesus' wonderful name and all of God's people say, amen. All right, uh, Revelation 5 tonight. Let's look together there, Revelation 5. Um, as uh, you have a Bible open there, I'm going to read with you. So Revelation 5, we read these wonderful, amazing words, very familiar probably to you, um, but uh, words like these should always strike us uh, as absolutely amazing, wonderful, uh, to exalt and lift up the Lord Jesus. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, that's chapter 4, right? That's God the Father. Uh, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much. Because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, a stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the, four, and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you are slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people 
and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the sea and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. And all of God's people say to those amazing words, Amen. All right, uh, Revelation 5, amazing words here. Uh, some, some things in life, as you probably know, uh, are so awe-inspiring that they don't need introduction. Uh, sometimes in life we have this experience um, that uh, uh, we can't even really describe what we are experiencing. Um, when I was 18 years old, uh, yeah, I was 18 years old, uh, almost 19, uh, playing basketball in college, uh, I had played in many places, but never had played in an arena as large as uh, the University of Utah. Uh, I think their stadium seats like eighteen thousand, which is pretty huge uh, for a basketball uh, for a basketball stadium. And uh, remember, remember driving up. It was a snowy uh, evening um, in Salt Lake City, and uh, show up there, and uh, you know we walk in the gym, and it's empty for shoot around, and of course this cavernous, huge building, uh, every bounce echoes, uh, like you can't imagine. And, uh, just an awe-inspiring sight. Go to the locker room, we change, do our pregame rituals and whatever, uh, and come out and the place is packed. Uh, just absolutely awe-inspiring. Um, you know, it takes, sort of takes your breath away, you know, more, more in a creational way, uh, maybe in a way that would, uh, uh, uh strike us a little more is uh, a few years past, I was able to go to, uh, Niagara Falls for the first time, and you know you park. If you've gone there before, you park in a, in a parking lot, um, and uh, you walk up, and like you can start hearing the the, the loud sound, this loud echoey sound. And, and as you get closer, you can actually feel, you can actually feel uh, the waterfall, and then of course you see it, and it's just absolutely breathtaking uh, to see how how high and how powerful, how loud, how how majestic um, are the Niagara Falls. Our text, uh, how much greater is our text? <laughs> how, mu- how much more amazing is Jesus, uh, the lamb upon the throne, this lamb who takes from uh, the father the scroll and, and, and unfurls it. Um, and we'll see that, that in chapter six, Lord willing, uh, soon enough. Uh, Pablo, hola, favorite member from Chile. Of course, the Cordero Rosado. Uh, y uh, vino de celestial, the, the, the best wine in the world and uh, the best meat. So, of course, uh, best memory. All right. Um, so uh, let's look here at Revelation 5. If, if you're taking notes, look in verses 1 to 4 with me. First of all, uh, you see there the weeping of John. So um, I have three points, and I mentioned sort of like a sermon uh, outline just for simplicity's sake, and we'll go through it, and we'll look at the, the notes and so forth. Um, uh, or make some notes in the text. So verses one to four, you see the weeping of John there. Uh, he says, then I saw, and so here's another vision. Uh, he's had multiple visions already. He sees another one. I saw, and he sees in the right hand of him uh, who was on the throne, God the Father, back in chapter four, uh, and in his right hand, and of course in scripture, the right hand is always the hand of power, isn't it? So it's a way of signifying his power. So in the, in the, in the hand of God, uh, is this scroll, and uh, on the back of it, and inside of it, uh, it has writing on it, and then it's it's sealed with uh, seven seals. Nelly, Larry, and Nelly, hello, all the way from New York. Hope you guys are doing doing well. Um, so it has seven seals. So you know, just imagine you 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 write a Christmas letter. Maybe you like roll it up like a scroll, and you melt some wax on it, and you put a little stamp on it, right? A little little finger. Uh, ring like a little seal uh, uh, to, to to authenticate that it's from you, uh, and this echoes Old Testament imagery. Doesn't all of Revelation, as I've been trying to to show, 
Uh, it, rec it echoes uh, the scrolls that are in the vision of the prophets Isaiah 29, Ezekiel 2, uh, 2 so Isaiah 29, Ezekiel 2, for example. Uh, but what's the scroll an image of? Okay, so it comes in the Old Testament, but what is it trying to communicate to us? Um, uh, it's, it's, it's the word uh, and the will of God. That's really what we're seeing here. And we'll see it especially in chapter 6 when, it, when these seals are un, 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 uh, uh, unfurled, they're unleashed, and what comes out, right? So this is the will of God. Um, and the fact that, this, that uh, uh, it's sealed not just with one, but seven seals... Uh, again, it shows that uh, this is a word, this is a will of God uh, that's complete, uh, that's uh, sufficient, that's all that is needed. So again, you know, this, this points us to what we saw last time. We've seen really the whole book, but last time where God is upon the throne in the center of the whole universe, everything surrounds him, the elders, the creatures, creation, everything surrounds him, uh, the rainbow surrounds him. Uh, he's at the center of, of, of human existence, right? With, uh, it's by his will that we uh, exist and were created, Revelation 4 told us at the end. Um, so his will for the world is complete, sufficient, and perfect. Uh, there, there's nothing more that's needed. And so God's word, God's will uh, is uh, what we need. Um, all that God has planned and purposed for the history of the human race that he's made, the world that he's made, is found within this scroll, uh, sealed with seven seals. Uh, John sees another vision. Notice that. I saw a strong angel, a mighty angel, proclaim with a loud voice, verse number two, who is worthy? Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals, to loose its seals? Notice what, and I've always found this interesting as we've gone through Revelation, uh, not just what is said, but also notice what is not said. Sometimes the, the, the God communicates to us not just by what he says, but also by what he withholds and what he doesn't say. Um, he doesn't say who is available. Notice that. Who is available to take the scroll and to open its seals? If that was the question, uh, there were, as the text says, thousands upon thousands, myriad of myriads of angels, attendants in heaven, who could have stepped forward and said, I'm available, I'm willing and able. So sometimes, you know, we like to say, you know, if you're willing and able, could you come over and help me? Well, in this case, willingness and ableness is, is not enough. It's not enough, right? So the question is not who is able um, uh, or who's available and, not, and also not who's able to open the scroll. Uh, these are mighty angels, we're told here, right? This is just a piece of paper, uh, parchment, and it has wax. Uh, any number of, of beings can uh, sufficiently open a scroll that's sealed with wax. And so these are mighty angels, we're told. A strong angel is proclaiming. Surely, uh, if it was about availability and ability, an angel like this surely could have taken the scroll and begun to peel off the pieces of wax. No, he doesn't uh, ask those questions. He asks a question that cannot be answered by just anyone who is worthy. Who is worthy. Uh, it's rhetorical, no one, right? Not John, not the angel, the strong angel, not the thousands upon thousands, myriad upon myriad of angels, not you or I either. Uh, we are not worthy. Listen to what John does say in verse number three. No one in heaven, angels, and even uh, the saints who are there, the elders and so forth, all these heavenly beings, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth. This is the typical... Uh, uh, this is the typical uh, 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 biblical cosmology, right? Heaven, earth, and uh, the things under the earth or the sea sometimes. Uh, in other words, every, uh, uh, in, in the whole realm of creation, there's no one, there's no thing. No one in heaven or earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it or to look into it. So this is a comprehensive way of describing uh, the situation uh, as it was there in the throne room of God himself. So to say heaven, earth, under the earth is a way of saying there's nowhere, uh, there's no place where anyone can be found who's worthy. What a powerful way for John to say, um, you're not God. You are not God. Uh, only he is. He says to you and me, you can't enter my presence. Uh, take from my hand the scroll of my will or open it up and know the mystery of the universe. You can't do that. You can't do that. You're a creature. Uh, you're dependent upon him. 
Uh, he's the creator. You're, 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 you are dust. Uh, he merely blows and you blow away. You're a sinner. He's holy. Like Isaiah in the temple, just being in God's presence for an instant, even in a vision. What was me for I'm undone? So John weeps. That's our big point here. The weeping of John, verse 4. I began to weep loudly because no one was, worthy, was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. If the scroll is not open, the chaos in the world in which chapters 2 and 3 have described the persecution of the church um, won't come to an end. Uh, if no one's worthy, God's will and word to help won't be executed, humanly speaking. So you have there the weeping of John. There's a problem. So scripture presents to us a problem. Uh, and then we find the resolution to that problem and the answer to it. I'm going to skip down to verses 5 through 10. Uh, notice with me the worthiness of Christ. So you have the weeping of John in contrast to the worthiness of Christ, who is worthy. John weeps because no one is. Uh, and that leads to this wonderful announcement. One of the elders, whom we saw in chapter 4, um, these uh, particular heavenly beings who reveal the, the, the words and will of God, uh, chapter 1 as well said, uh, one of these elders, uh, we, we, we hear saying this, Weep no more! Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so, he, so that he can open the scrolls and its seven seals. But I thought John said no one was able, no one was available in all the universe to open the scroll. How is a lion able to do so? How is he worthy? Well, because he's not an animal, is he? Uh, he's not part of the created realm that's in heaven above, on the earth beneath, or, or under the earth. Uh, this is, again, uh, a symbol. This is, again, a metaphor. This is, again, a, a, a vision meant to describe to us the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, who is equal in glory and majesty uh, with the Father and the Spirit, who came down to earth, who left eternity for time, being infinite, took on finitude be by becoming a human being like us in every way, yet without sin. So uh, this amazing, amazing vision here of the one who is uh, worthy, Described as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Why is he called here the lion of the tribe of Judah? Um, well, that takes us all the way back to Genesis 49. We're here at the end of the scriptures and we go to the very beginning of the scriptures. Um, and uh, uh, the patriarch Jacob is blessing his children. He describes a son, Judah that he's like a lion and said that, uh, and, and, and Jacob says that from uh, Judah would come kings to rule over Israel. And you see that in Revelation or in Genesis 49 verse 9, 49 verse number uh, 9. Uh, he's not just another lion though, okay? He is uh, not just another king, but he's the lion from the tribe of God's people from which came David and all the kings. Uh, like David, uh, he's a man from David's tribe. But he's more than a mere man, isn't he? He's more than a mere man. Um, he's Israel's greatest king. Anthony, how's it going? If you guys don't know Anthony Salong Singh, he teaches at uh, Reformation Bible College uh, in Sanford, Florida. And uh, used to be a member of here. We, we miss you. And uh, Noel, hope you guys are doing well. Um, uh, so he's, he's a lion of the tribe of Judah. He's also called, the, notice, the root of David. Okay, the root of David. So... Um, and that comes to us from Isaiah in multiple places. Isaiah 53, for example, is one place. Um, note that. Uh, although, he's be, although he was born a thousand years after David, uh, Jesus was, um, he's the one who gave birth to David in the first place, which is the amazing truth about who he is. Uh, if David is the tree, then Jesus is the root from which that tree came. In other words, Jesus is worthy because he's the greatest king found in heaven, earth or under the earth, uh, but also because he's not from this creation. He's not a mere lion. He's not a mere lamb. He's not a mere angel, even a great strong one, but he is the Lord. Uh, he is the God-man. He is Theanthropos, the God-man, uh, the son who takes upon himself humanity, human nature. Uh, he's conquered, we're told, verse 5. Notice that. Uh, and uh, so that he can't open the scroll and it's seven seals. Well, how? Notice again, another vision, uh, verse number six there, and I looked and behold, so he's seeing all these visions uh, flash as it were before his eyes, between the throne 
and the four living creatures. And among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. So a sacrificed lamb with seven horns. Horns are Old Testament uh, metaphor for strength. There are seven of them. He has all power and authority that has been given to him. Matthew 28, right? Um, he has seven eyes. Uh, he sees all things. He knows all things. Those seven eyes are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So the lion's the lamb, the victor's the victim, the strong one's the sacrifice one. The one who gives life to all things as creator becomes the one whose death new life is given. Uh, by, by whose death new life is given. And uh, we, we sing uh, here at least in Oceanside in our Christmas Eve service, our liturgy uh, of scripture readings uh, and uh, scripture lessons and Christmas carols, uh, that wonderful line in one of our hymns, uh, Glorious now, behold him arise, King and God and sacrifice. What a wonderful uh, 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 vision there and uh, uh, expression of this Revelation 5. Glorious now, behold him arise, King and God and sacrifice. God and a sacrifice. Isn't that amazing that we can speak of Jesus that way? Hey, Nick, how's it going? Um, so Jesus, uh, he's not even, he's not called Jesus yet, is he? So the, the lamb, the lion, this lamb lion is worthy, unlike all creatures in heaven above, earth beneath, and everything, everything else underneath it. He is worthy because he is perfect man, perfect God, accomplishing the will of God. We see this where uh, uh, this is why the elders and the creatures in verse number nine say, worthy are you for or because you were slain for because you were slain. Jeannie, um, uh, and by your blood, you ransomed people for God. So I, I find it absolutely amazing here that he is worthy because he was slain, right? He, he's able to open up the, uh, to take the scroll and to begin to peel off its seals because he died, because he died, because he was slain for us. And by his blood, he ransomed us as uh, people for God. And note that when verse 6 describes Jesus as lamb, saying as though it had been slain, um, it's interesting here, the, the, the choice of verb tense that John uses, or the, uh, the, the revelator uses, John, um, which is a perfect tense, um, signifying Jesus uh, in his uh, continued existence as the lamb lion, uh, the one who has been and always shall be uh, our sacrifice for us and our sins. And, and so, the, so the question is, you know, are you worthy to do this, to open up the scroll, to, take the, the, uh, to open up the scroll, to take the seals off of it? Absolutely not, because of our sin, because of your sins. Uh, are you a sinner? But if you are, there's a sacrifice for you. There's one who has been slain once and for all, as Hebrews tells us. And because of that, his sacrifice is perpetual for us. It's always there before the throne of God, pleading uh, our cause for us. Because our Lord is worthy, at his ascension, he approached the heavenly throne worthily. And as John tells us, verse 7, he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who is seated on the throne. Brothers and sisters, loved ones, friends, uh, no one else can take anything out of the right hand, the hand of power of God himself, unless he's God. No one can take from the Father the scroll unless he is the Son. And you cannot do this unless you're divine. Here is your Lord. Here is your Savior. Here is God. Here is Jesus, the Lamb Lion. Now notice in verses 8 through 14. So we've seen uh, John's weeping. That's the problem. Uh, we see the worthiness of Christ. Uh, he is the solution. He is the remedy to the problem that John uh, hears from the angel who is worthy. Um, Verses 8 through 14, we see the worship of creation. So, so no one in heaven above, earth beneath, anything else underneath is worthy to take, this, to take the scroll and to open its seals. And now that very same creation uh, gives praise, uh, worth as it were, to the one who is worthy. Uh, and uh, uh, there are some things, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, some things that are that that leave us speechless. I mentioned uh, playing basketball in a massive uh, arena, uh, or as an 18-year-old, or later on, uh, just a few years back, going to Niagara Falls. Whatever it is that we see, that we participate in, that we experience, uh, that 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 takes our breath away. Um, 
this is what we get a sense of here in the worship of creation, verses 8 through 14. Here is, our, here is our Savior, the Son of God, sacrificed. And we sing words like these, uh, one of our hymns, What language shall I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend? For this thy dying sorrow, thy pity without end. What language shall I borrow? We should be left speechless, and we should be left uh, in awe of Jesus here. To worship our Savior in thankfulness, uh, we're helped by the angels in heaven. They, they help us do this. Uh, we can borrow their language to use that hymn's uh, words in verses 8 to 14. Uh, just like we, we as parents teach our kids to speak properly, to act properly, um, to, re to show respect in a proper way, um, God shows us through these angels how we ought to speak and act properly in the presence of of the Lord. Um, notice uh, something wonderful here um, about God and how his word here in this revelation is organized. Uh, we saw back in chapter 4, verse number 8 from last week. Uh, that the four living creatures praise God. Uh, and then we saw in 4, verses 9 through 11, that when the four living creatures give praise, so do the 24 elders. They follow suit. Uh, now here in verse uh, chapter 5, verse 8, we read that the four living creatures and the 24 elders praise the Lamb. Uh, look at verse 11 through 12. It's not just the living creatures and the elders who are doing this, but also the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands. They're praising the Lamb. Uh, notice how the number of those worshiping is increasing from chapter 4 to 5. Uh, and finally, you have there in chapter 5, verse 13, John hears every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in, and in the sea and all that is in them. Right? In other words, he's, he's just he's, he's straining language to say everything, everyone. What are they doing? They're praising him who sits on the throne and, and they're praising the lamb. You don't worship an angel. You don't worship the archangel Michael, as our Jehovah's Witness friend says. You don't worship a creature. You don't worship uh, even a good man or a perfect man. You worship God. If you worship anything else other than God, you're an idolater. And so all creation is bowing down and worshiping God the Father upon the throne, as we saw in chapter 4. But now they're worshiping as well the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. Behold the Savior, the God King, our Lord Jesus Christ. Note their praise uh, which which needs to be, as we read Revelation 5, ours as well. It needs to be more and more ours as well. We praise Christ for what he's done. Worthy are you to take the scrolls. Notice that. We first of all praise Christ for who he is. He's worthy. And that's enough. But then there's more reasons. Notice he is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain. He died for us. He was sacrificed for us. By your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe, language, people, nation. You've made them a kingdom and priest to our God. They shall reign on the earth, verses 9 through 10. Worthy is a lamb who was slain, verse 12. So what's the focus here, right? What's the focus here? Hey, Eric, a oh, fellow brother from URCNA, Messiah's Reformed in uh, New York City. If you live in New York City, you know someone who does, uh, hop on. Um, the subway, I don't know if it's open. Uh, I'm not a New Yorker, but uh, hop on the subway, grab a cab, um, get a ride, head on out to Messiah's Reform Fellowship. Um, uh, and you'll, you'll hear awesome preaching. You'll hear Pastor Paul Murphy uh, bring, bring the word. Uh, he, he is a fellow former Roman Catholic uh, who loves Jesus Christ alone uh, as Savior. He proclaims him uh, week in, week out. So uh, praise the Lord that... Uh, uh, that uh, Jesus is lifted up everywhere. Here in Oceanside, New York City, everywhere across the world. So he's worthy. What's the focus here? The cross, though. Notice the, notice the cross uh, is the focus of this praise. So he's worthy, right? He's intrinsically, inherently worthy as the God-man. 
And that's enough reason to praise him. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory and honor and so forth, the Psalms say. But notice the focus is the cross. And that's the irony here of Revelation. These are Christians in chapters 2 and 3 who are, uh, in many ways, struggling to live as Christians in a world. Chapter 1 said that John is a fellow participant in the tribulation. This whole entire age is the tribulation age. And it waxes and wanes. It gets harder and easier uh, in, in times. And so, you know, it's been easy for us as Christians, and now it's a little harder for us to, to serve God uh, with, without being able to gather and all the things that are going on. And we're trying to be good citizens. We're trying to, and we're struggling in our minds with how that all works. Worthy, worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb. He died for us. The irony of the Christian faith, notice, is that the, la- is that the lion who has all authority and power is a lamb who was slain. Uh, and we, and we, uh, enter the presence of God through his being conquered. It's by dying that we live. And so he ironically was conquered. The cross then, the cross then, uh, is the theme of our preaching, our worship, our singing, our witness, our living. The cross. Worthy is the lamb because he was slain. The heavenly choir sing. And we praise Christ in every way we can with everything within us. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, blessing. How many ascriptions and descriptions are there here? No surprise if you're paying attention. Seven, right? One of the big numbers of Revelation. There are seven numbers here. Complete praise, perfect praise, whole praise is given to Jesus. By all creation, heaven above, earth beneath, all things under the earth, and all things in the sea, and all that fills them, they're giving full sevenfold praise to God. After all, that Jesus has done, we give him all we can. Uh, we give him back all we can. What language shall I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend? Thy pity without sorrow, uh, as that wonderful hymn says. Uh, For this thy dying sorrow, thy pity without end. Uh, so we praise Christ, and uh, uh, we realize that even with our, uh, uh, even with all of our different languages, even with all of our uh, wonderful singing and our harmonizations, it's, it's inadequate. It's inadequate. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is he. We praise Christ as we praise the Father, as well as I mentioned, verses 13 to 14. Uh, that brings us back full circle from chapter 4. No one in heaven, no one on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll to look into it. Chapter three, uh, Verse 3 said of our chapter. Uh, but, but now that, that it has been revealed that the only one who is worthy is the lion whose lamb, every creature, those same creatures in heaven, earth, under the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, Praise Father, Son, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Be blessing, honor, glory, might forever and ever. And in the end, like the hosts of heaven, notice in chapter 5 how it all ends and everyone says what? They all say, Amen. So be it. Falling down, worshiping him who lives forever and ever. Notice something about that. So there's the Father in chapter 4. Here is the Son, Jesus, the Lamb Lion in chapter 5. And uh, they're both worshipped. They're both praised. And then at the end, it's worthy is he. Worthy is the one, right, upon the throne. Uh, God described here in his oneness, in his uh, threeness, uh, we have the Father, Son, and Spirit described as the seven eyes that go out into all the earth. Uh, we have a wonderful, amazing picture here, a full picture of what it is to worship. We worship a triune God. We worship God the Father, especially through His Son, our Lord Jesus, the power and reliance of the Holy Spirit. We do that. We, we join all creation in heaven and earth, worshiping and glorifying a Savior who is King, who is able and sufficient to meet every single need that we will ever have, not just in this life, but the life to come, not just in the life to come, in this life. And all creation knows that. All creation acknowledges this. It all knows that he is alive and that he has been brought back from death to life. He's worthy, brothers and sisters. He's worthy. Let us praise him with worthy praise Let us seek to acknowledge him with our lips. Let us live it out with our lives. Let's use our minds to glorify him, uh, our bodies to praise him, our words to praise him, our thoughts to praise him. 
Jesus, we're told here in Revelation 5, is worthy. He's worthy to take the scroll from God's very own hand to unfurl the seals of all of God's will for human history. And he is worthy of praise and honor and glory because he was slain to redeem a people from every tribe, language, people, and nation. So no matter where we are uh, even now, and if we listen to this later, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is a sufficient Savior for any and every and all sinners on the face of the earth. He's worthy. And so we give him our lives. Give him your life. And you will come to know the wonderful joy of belonging to him, body and soul, life and in death, our faithful and wonderful Savior, Jesus. Let's pray. We bless and praise you, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. We thank you for Jesus, our wonderful, blessed Savior, for the power of your Holy Spirit who is within our hearts, uh, who has been given to us to pour out your love into our hearts, that we might know you and love you back in return. And Lord, help us and enable us as your people uh, here in Oceanside and everywhere, Lord, where my brothers and sisters are meeting and gathering and even watching this after. Lord, would you draw your people closer to you and use us, uh, Lord, as your people to revive, to revive uh, the church, to bring salvation to the ends of the earth, and Lord, to hasten your coming, that wonderful day to come when Jesus Christ will rule and reign uh, and over all things, Lord, not merely from heaven, but Lord, as all things are brought together on a new heavens and a new earth. And we ask all this in Jesus' wonderful, precious, and powerful name, and all of God's people say, amen. May the Lord bless you and uh, pray you're encouraged to go back and uh, reread Revelation 5 and look at uh, the wonderful ways in which Jesus is worthy to be praised. Amen.